Welcome into Hitting Hard with John Chuckery here on Locked On Sports Atlanta. Today on the show, the Hawks stink it up again. Let's be real. The Hawks are overmatched. And let's have a little bit of faith in Ritter when all is said and done. It's all coming up next. It's Hitting Hard with John Chuckery, Locked On Sports Atlanta. This is Hitting Hard with John Chuckery, part of Locked On Sports Atlanta. And it starts now. Hitting Hard is brought to you by FanDuel Sportsbook, the official sportsbook of Locked On. Make every moment more. Visit FanDuel.com slash Locked On today to get started. We ask you to subscribe for free or follow us on YouTube or wherever you listen to your podcast from. And then you can follow me on my personal Twitter page at JMCH316. Well, it was not a good night up in Boston again. Now the Hawks are 0-5 for the year against the Boston Celtics. 0-5 for the year. 119-106 they lose last night. And I got all kinds of numbers about what this game ended up being. Hawks in this series. Let's talk about a couple of things that we stressed on that we talked about last Friday that we harped on, okay? Number one, Hawks had to play some good defense, right? Okay, Hawks had to play some good defense. This was a very efficient offensive team. They were giving up 127 points. They were giving up, I think it was uh, 47% from three or this, that, and the other. Through the first two games of this series, the Hawks are 21 for 77 from three. They're shooting 27.3%. They're giving up. 34 of 66 for 51 and a half percent from behind three. So the Celtics are shooting 51 and a half percent from beyond three. Celtics scored 74 points in the first half in game one. They scored 61 points in game two in the first half. Derek White who's been unbelievable, right? He's the guy that they can't stop. And for a team that has all of this talent, right, for for Jalen Brown and Tatum and Smart and all these guys, for all these guys, Derek White. Derek White has had 50 points in two games. He has scored 26 and 24 in the two games against the Atlanta Hawks. Did a little bit of research on all of this, okay? This is only the fourth time in the, sorry, the fifth time in the last three years that he's even had back-to-back games of 20 plus points. In the 2021 season, he had one such incident where he had back-to-back games of 20 plus points. In the 2021-2022 season, he had one such incident when he had back-to-back games of 20 plus points. And then this past season, He did it two times. So he doubled his output, did it two times. In fact, one time he had in February of 2023, he had three games in a row where he scored 20 plus points. And then he had on March 21st and March 24th in back-to-back games, he had 20 plus points. So when I tell you it's a rare feat that Derek White gets back-to-back 20 point games, you know that you're in trouble when, when you get to that point. Here's what the Hawks, uh, now, so we've got that part of it, right? We, we, we've got the defensive part of it, okay? What do we also say? That the Hawks have to shoot the three ball better, right? The Hawks have to make shots. They have to shoot the three ball better because they were only shooting at 26.7% from three during the regular season against the Celtics, okay? Well, the Hawks have managed to shoot better, all of 0.6% better. Hawks are 21 of 77, 27.3% as compared to the 26.7% they shot during the regular season. So they've climbed up 0.6%. So I guess let's be happy for small miracles when all is said and done. But here's your three-point shooting by player over the first two games of this series. Trey Young is three for 13. Collins is one for eight. Hunter is three for 13. Bay is one for eight. Bogey is six for 14. Murray is seven for 19. If you look at that game last night, if you took away DeJounte Murray and Bogey, 
They were five for 28 from three, 17.9%. The bench that we bragged about, right? They they scored 53 points against the Miami Heat, and they did all these good things and hustle plays and all this kind of stuff, okay? They had 24 points in game one, 26 points in game two. Your bench is giving you in two games 50 points. That's that's three less points than they had just against the Miami Heat. And oh yeah, for craps and giggles, the four guys you brought off the bench, they averaged a minus 13 and a half per player in plus minus last night. In fact, every one of your bench players was in double figures in plus minus from a minus perspective. So the, the average bench player had a minus 13 and a half off the bench last night. Hawks have scored in their five games against the Boston Celtics, an average of 109 points per game. What they scored during the regular season, 118.4 points per game. So no matter how you slice this, I, I give you more numbers. Clint Capella, he's averaging eight points and only seven and a half rebounds. DeAndre Hunter, 12 for 29, 41.4% from the floor. No matter what number that you point to, this has been a disaster of a series. This has been rough going. But last night, you know, they were up 22 to 11. Believe it or not, at one point, they were up in the game 22 to 11. And then the Celtics went on like a 20 to 3 run and never looked back. And yeah, you know, we're bragging about, you know, well, the Hawks cut it down to eight here and they Saturday cut it down to 12 here. And, you know, the other day they cut it down to eight and this and six and, and all this kind of stuff. What difference does all that make? What difference does it make that the Hawks go on? A, the Hawks should go on a little bit of a run. They're the third third best scoring team in the, in the league. I mean, they should go on a run. They should be able to get some points. They should be able to do some things offensively. But they haven't played defense and they haven't been able to hit the three ball. And that's the two things we specifically talked about that this Hawks team had to do in this series. And and obviously, with the way the Celtics offense, you know, offense works, you know, you're getting big contributions out of Jason Tatum and Jalen Brown, who's just back for the playoffs. And, and Derek White obviously is having monster nights against you. On the other hand, though, you know, we're seeing the Hawks struggle from the field. Murray was 11 for 24. Trey was 9 for 22. They're not creating a lot of energy and, and, and opportunity. Capella had four points. DeAndre Hunter was 8 for 19. 8 for 19. 2 for 9 from 3 in the game last night. Didn't even get to the free throw line. Just frustrating all the way around the way that this series unfolded. Just frustrating to see how this thing has gone down for the Atlanta Hawks because we hyped ourselves into the idea of that this was going to be a good competitive series. I, I don't know where it's falling apart. But can I tell you, though, okay, this is more than just coaching. This is more than just Quinn Snyder is going to put the elixir in and he's going to fix everything. This is more than just, hey, you know, Quinn Snyder can come in here and give us a boost and some energy, and it's all Nate's fault and, and everything else, okay? Quinn Snyder and Nate McMillan can't make guys make shots. Quinn Snyder and Nate McMillan can't give guys that want to and that hustle to want to play defense. So it's frustrating all the way around when you see all this. Frustrating all the way around. Again, I can give you all kinds of numbers. Bogey's the only guy off our bench that's been double figures in points. He was in double figures last night with 18. That's the only guy off the bench that has had a double-digit scoring game in his first two games of this series. Just goes on and on and on with the numbers and just where this franchise is at. So we're going to talk in just a second here about the Hawks in this matchup. But first, let's talk about our friends over at FanDuel, listen, FanDuel is America's number one sports book, and his baseball season is underway. Obviously, the Braves are out in San Diego. Great win again last night for him. Pounded on the uh, Padres offense. Max Fried was outstanding a couple of nights before that with a masterful performance. 
FanDuel is America's number one sports book. And when you're a new customer to FanDuel, you can go to FanDuel.com and sign up today and claim your no sweat first bet where you can get as much as $1,000 in bonus bets if your first bet doesn't win. FanDuel.com slash locked on is the place to go. FanDuel.com slash L-O-C-K-E-D-O-N. You can download the app. It's safe, secure, super easy to use. And obviously, you can bet on everything from money lines to prop bets to points to how many homers a guy is going to hit, everything in between. So head to FanDuel.com slash locked on today and claim your no sweat first bet where you can get as much as a thousand dollars in bonus bets if your first bet doesn't win. That's FanDuel.com slash L-O-C-K-E-D-O-N. FanDuel is the official sportsbook betting partner of Major League Baseball. So I I said last night on my radio show that this Hawks-Celtics matchup, this is more lopsided than Denver and Minnesota when you look at a playoff matchup. This is is maybe the biggest mismatch. We, we can't stop them offensively. And, and any time that we get on these, you know, we, we, we people talk about, well, you know, we, we cut this and we did this and, and all these good things. But again, you know, so you're cutting it down to eight or 10 or 12 or whatever like that. You're still getting rolled, still getting rolled. And, and I guess we were fooled into thinking that after that Miami Heat game, because, look, they did something that we did not expect them to do when they went down to Miami and they pulled off a victory down there, right? They had lost seven times in a row in Miami. They, they were one and three against Miami, but they were three and 10 over the last two years total from the regular season and playoffs, three and 10 against the Heat. There was nothing that told us that they should go down there and win that game. But yet they found a way, right? The the bench got 53 points. They were rebounding the basketball at an unbelievable pace, 63-39 in rebounds, blocking shots, doing all these different things, right? Hustle plays, 50-50 balls, all of these different things, right? And and we said to ourselves, self, why can't they have more nights like this? Why can't they have more nights like this? And Ooh, you know, we've got the Celtics, and listen, we're going to take it prideful and personal. We're going to take it personal that we're 0-3 during the regular season against the Boston Celtics. We're going to take that personal and figure out a way to beat them. And now here we sit a couple of games in, and we're 0-5 against the Celtics this year. You know, Friday night, you know, the Friday night when the Hawks came back, come back home to State Farm Arena. It'll be a raucous crowd. There'll be all kinds of people. There'll probably be a lot of Celtics fans there because they travel and they're going to come out of the woodwork, you know, in Atlanta. We we used to seeing that. But there'll be a big crowd. It'll be raucous. It'll be loud. I mean, it, it will be a very much a, a very supportive crowd for the Atlanta Hawks. And yeah, they may win a game in this series. But if you think that this team is going to go you know, to Boston because they'll have to go back at some point. You think they're going to Boston and beating the Celtics? I mean, let me put it this way. If you think there's any chance that the Hawks are going to win four of the next five games, you're crazy. You're crazy to think that. And we probably should have said, okay, well, uh, you know, again, a lot of us said that going into this thing is like, eh, okay, you know, this is not a very good match for the Atlanta Hawks. And, and all the things that have kind of come to roost over the regular season have popped their head right back up as to why, again, literally, you're, you're the exact same percentage from three as you were during the regular season. You still have all of your defensive issues where you've given up 135 points in the first half to the Celtics. All of the same things have crept up and creeped up and all these different kinds of things. And you just say to yourself, what a bad matchup that this is. I'm telling you, it's the most lopsided matchup in the first round of the playoffs, even more than Denver and Minnesota. That's saying a lot. That's saying a lot about where this Hawks-Celtic series is right now. 
but they can't figure out a way to get it done defensively in the first half. They can't figure out a way to throw the ball in the ocean. We just broke down for you all the different players and how they're shooting and different things like that. It's frustrating. It's frustrating because you see nights against Miami and you know that they can do that when they come all together, right? When they, when they put it all together, they can figure out a way to play with and beat good teams in the NBA. We've seen it over the last couple of years. We see these blips and bloops and stuff like that on the radar, right? You know, Golden State coming here this year, beating the world champions. You know, last year it was President's Day or something like that where Phoenix had won 11 games in a row. It might have been MLK Day, but President's Day or something like that. Phoenix had won 11 road games in a row. They were the best team in the NBA, blah, 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 blah. And they come to State Farm Arena and the Hawks dominate them. Hawks control that game all the way through. You see those moments. You see those moments where the Hawks figure it out and that light bulb kicks in and they put it all together. Problem is they can't do that on a consistent basis. And and this is a matchup where they're outclassed, they're outgunned. And, and by the way, this is not about Trey Young. This, this is everybody. This is why I say Quinn Snyder just can't magically come in here and make everything better. This is about everybody for the Hawks. And I've been saying this for weeks and months now, that this is a very flawed basketball team. And I expect that there's going to be changes in this offseason. And I think that there's going to be definite personnel changes. I have two questions for Tony Ressler. That my two questions are, number one, are we willing to go in the luxury tax next year? I don't want to hear about we go in the luxury tax if it's right or correct or at the right time or whatever like that. I want to know, are we going in the luxury tax next year? And I want to know what Quinn Snyder's role in player uh, personnel is. What's his role? Does he have the ultimate authority? Does he have some authority? Is it collaborative, communicative? That's the two questions I want to know from Tony Ressler. Are we going to the luxury tax? And what role will Quinn Snyder play in the roster? Once I get that answered, then I'll have a clear understanding about how we're going to move forward, how we're going forward with the progress of this roster. And I do think that there are going to be changes coming. Frustrating. Frustrating all the way around for this Hawks team. All right, after you make Hitting Hard with John Chuck for your first listen, make sure that when you listen in, you leave us a comment and let us know that you're an everyday listener. We call it our everydayers. So when you're listening in, whether it's YouTube or whatever podcast platform that you listen in on, make sure you leave us a comment to let us know that you are an everyday listener. We value you so much and appreciate the fact that you listen in every day. We want to recognize you and we want to be known, you know, who is our everyday listener. So thank you so much for doing all of that as you listen into Hitting Hard with John Chuckery every single day. So let's have a little bit of faith in Desmond Ritter. You know, I, there was an article in at, on AtlantaFalcons.com <clears throat> that uh, talking to Desmond Ritter about the idea that he got named the quarterback, right? I mean, he's QB1 now and it's all good. Um, Desmond had a couple things to say in this article, and I'll read you a couple of his quotes and things like that. Quote, they told me that they trust me and they see what I do on the field. <clears throat> they see my leadership and that's important. I'm just going to continue to be myself, who I am, be the leader I can be, and go out there and keep it moving. And Ritter went on to say that, quote, when you look at their offense, quote, you go back and look at those four games, and each game as a player and offense, we got better. It's obviously not where we want it to be at the end of the season, but I can see where we can be and what we can do. I'm excited for the progress that we showed, and hopefully we can continue to have that progress moving throughout. Now, look, I've said that last year, my favorite draft pick of the what the Falcons did, my favorite draft pick was Desmond Ritter. And I, when you look at the quarterback position in the NFL, okay, some of it is your scouting, some of it is luck, okay, and some of it is just right place, right time with guys, right? I mean, there's, there's not necessarily an ex- explanation or expectation of why things happen the way that they do. Pat Mahomes was the number 10 pick in the NFL draft. You could make a case right now. He's the best player in the NFL draft. And I would have no problem telling you that he's the best player. But you didn't expect Pat Mahomes to come in and just dominate the league. He didn't expect a Kyle 
um, a, a Josh Allen, I should say, not Kyle, but Josh Allen to come in out of Wyoming and dominate the league. But here we are, you know, and when you look at these things, there, there's one thing about a quarterback that I really love, and that is the intangible of winning. You know, were you a winner in college football? Because when you're playing at the level at a Cincinnati or different things like that, if you're not leading your team, if you're not showing that you're a team or sorry, a, a player that can lead his team to victory and, and get them over the top, then again, I have I'm going to have questions about you because, look, everybody can be a stat machine, right? You know, guys can be guys can play at smaller school. You know, Andre Ware. You know, Andre Ware put up all the numbers in the world, right? Heisman Trophy winner. You know, he threw for like seven thousand yards in college football in a season, and just all these ridiculous numbers. But did it get him anywhere? Did, did they, were they winning and things like that? No. But you roll the dice on a first round guy because you say, well, gosh, this guy's threw for seven thousand yards in a season. You know, he threw. 50 touchdowns in a season. He's got to be good, right? No, there, there's more to it than that. And, and this is why I have faith in Desmond Ritter, is because this kid is a winner all the way around. He understands where they were at. He understands the flaws and warts of this team. He understands what is going on with this franchise. And he knows that they've got to be better. And he knows that they've got to improve offensively. He's got to improve offensively. I agree with what his statement was. I agree that Desmond Ritter played better himself, personally, himself, each week that he got his four starts. I believe that the offense played better as the season wore on over those four starts, that they were better in week, the, the fourth week of the season, the fourth week, of the last game of the regular season, um, than they were that first week that he took over. I believe all of that. Now, again, he acknowledges, is it where we want it to be? No. But I love Desmond Ritter because he's a winner. And he's not maybe the biggest stat machine. He's not maybe the, the guy who's going to go out and impress you or, you know, he's going to, you know, be like a Lamar and he's going to run 4-2 and he's going to have 1,500 yards and all of these stats and numbers behind him. But what I do know is he finished 2-2 two and two on the season. <clears throat> and as a... <clears throat> excuse me, as a rookie quarterback, the fact that he was able to get this roster to two and two even speaks volumes. And the fact that they were better as the season moved along as, as he moved along through that four game progression, that he got more comfortable, performed better, and the team had success. And, and isn't it funny? And when your quarterback plays better, that you find a way to have more team success. Isn't that kind of one of those funky things like, wow, okay. You know, we, we can maybe turn a corner. So I have faith in Desmond Ritter that I don't look at him as a guy who's going to put up gaudy numbers and high completion percentages and 5,000 yards and 40 touchdowns and just all of the physical tools. Does he have a lot of that stuff? Yes, he's got physical tools. He can do things. He can, he can run around if you want him to, okay? He ran for 2,500 yards in college. He can run around and do some different things and stuff like that. But what he is, more than anything, is a winner. And, and he's a guy that players around him believe in and have faith that he can lead them to victory. May not always be the prettiest way. You know, he won a lot of games in college. I mean, I don't know where he was at as far as win totals in college and different things like that. But the fact that he got Cincinnati to a national semifinal game, and they played, you know, to, to the Peach Bowl the year before. And they played the Georgias and Ohio State and Michigan, or sorry, not the, or Alabama, I should say, UCLA. You know, they had a lot of tough competition on their schedule because teams want to try to play in Cincinnati. But Desmond Ritter was a guy that won in, in a big-time level that nobody expected. And I, I believe in Desmond Ritter. I, I have faith in him. It may not be pretty at times. He may not have the gaudy numbers and the different things that you're looking for, but we have to have some faith in Desmond Ritter because this is what's good for the franchise. 
right? Now, if Desmond Ritter does not play well at all this year and they're still with a losing record, Desmond will probably be replaced or the coaching staff and the general manager will be replaced. But I have to have faith in Desmond Ritter that he can figure this thing out and that he is a good quarterback that this team and their offense will believe in and he will find a way to lead them to victory because Desmond Ritter is a winner. No matter what you can say, you can talk about his numbers and his running skill and all these different kinds of things. But one thing you can't say about Desmond Ritter is that he's not a winner because Desmond Ritter is a winner. And when I'm looking at quarterbacks, okay, there is something intangible about the idea of being able to win. I'll, I'll, I'll sacrifice gaudy numbers if at the end of the day I can get victories. Whether you want to be the, the head guy, game manager, whatever you want to do, I'll sacrifice stats for wins every day of the week. Because in the NFL, at the end of the day, when you look on ESPN.com and you click the NFL standings, the only thing that matters is did you win or did you lose? Let's have a little bit of faith in Desmond Ritter as we get ready for this upcoming season. All right, we thank you so much for making Hitting Hard with John Chuck where you first listen every day. Um, we want you to leave us a comment when you listen in to our podcast of whether or not you're an everyday listener to the show. So leave us a comment that tells us you are an everydayer, as we like to say. So we appreciate it so much. We thank you so much for being a part to, of our community. Uh, you can subscribe or follow for free on YouTube. And by the way, we're over 6,000 subscribers or wherever you get your podcast from. Get the latest episodes of Hitting Hard as soon as they become available. So we thank you again for being loyal listeners out there. We'll be back tomorrow, Hitting Hard with John Chuckery, Locked on Sports Atlanta.